Hello, thank you all for joining us. Um, Yezana and I are working actually together on an exhibition for uh, the Palestinian Museum. And uh, the Palestinian Museum just uh, inaugurated as a building last year, in, uh, in May of last year. And they have not started programming and they invited me end of last year to come and do the inaugural show. Um, and they set the parameter to be on Jerusalem. So I was invited to do an exhibition on Jerusalem, and, um, and, it, and the exhibition now opens in the end of August, on the 27th of August is the public opening. Um, and uh, both Yez and I, and I are working on uh, various capacities together, uh, me being the curator, but Yezan being an invited artist, and also he's the technical director who's helping me uh, foresee and make the works of several artists. I just wanted to give a little brief, uh, this conversation is going to be a little bit winding, <laughs> knowing ourselves, but I just wanted to give a little brief on the landscape in Palestine uh, for institutions, and uh, a little bit of a background on the exhibition itself. Um, and we'll segue to also the work that Yezen is doing and, uh, and highlight a little bit of the project that we're doing together. Basically, Palestine has not had, a, uh, has not had an established museum project built in it, um, although there has been numerous artist initiatives, uh, artist-run spaces, and various cultural centers that have happened uh, focusing on in Jerusalem, but there has been a lot of closures that have happened in Jerusalem for many of these, let's say, Palestinian-run institutions. Um, and or they are going through a lot of dire circumstances. At the same time, there has always been talk through several initiatives, collectors, various organizations, and especially the Welfare Association, which is the one that founded the current Palestinian Museum, about building a museum project for Palestine. It's quite interesting to think that, you know, they want to build the museum before there is even a state, which is, you know, it's a, it's a museological language that is a little bit contradictory. And I find that to be quite fascinating, which also opens the question of what do we expect the museum to really want to, to be able to do um, in a place where, for example, we don't have borders, we can't ship anything without the permits from the Israelis, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many you know, circumstances that are quite important to think about. Um, for example, lives of people are in, in peril. Do you really want to salvage objects? I mean, that's a very important, another important question in that, uh, in the midst. Um, but they did open the museum. And uh, in fact, it's a glorious museum uh, located on the hilltop adjacent to Birzeit University, which is one, the kind of number one university in Palestine in Ramallah, in the town of Birzeit. And, um, and the actual museum size is not very big. And it centers around one major hall, but a lot of beautifully landscaped gardens. Um, so. Now we do have a museum, and it's functioning. Uh, but also, just to give a little bit of a history, um, there, like the, some of the pre precursors or predecessors to this museum, were some of them. Like there are two very important institutions in Palestine, and currently still very active, uh, but in a, a little bit of a dilemma. The Khalil Sakakini Cultural Center, which is actually run in a volunteer capacity by Yazan. And I had the pleasure of working in that center nearly 20 years ago. And uh, a Qatan Foundation, and Qatan Foundation, actually the founder, one of the founders of Qatan is on the board of the museum. So it's a little, it's an interesting situation. I'd like Yazan for you to start by talking about the situation of Khalil Sakakini Cultural Center, a little bit of its history and and then we'll go back to the museum in a much more, I think, tied up. Thanks, Reem. Um, yeah. Um, 
So, as Reem said, I'm now, since two years, uh, I'm running Khalil Sakini Cultural Center um, voluntary, um, which is somehow, um, I would say, just to uh, relax myself, I would say this kind of an art practice, um, that I'm not paid to run an institution, so it must be an artwork. Um, the, the thing in, in Palestine that's happened, and I think it's happening to many of the cultural institutions in Palestine and, of course, in the Arab world, um, after the Arab Spring in 2011, many of the um, funding that used to go to culture uh, stopped going to culture and went into a more emergency um, uh, f yeah, for refugees, for um, the crises that are happening around in the Arab region. Um, and of course, the first thing you cut when, um, when there is a crisis, you cut on culture. And I guess culture is always on the front line of, um, um, of everything. No? Like you can understand from the cultural practices what's happening and also um, uh, on intellectual level, but you can also know what's happening on political level and economical level. Um, so Khalil Sakini Cultural Center being established 20 years ago, one of the first cultural NGOs in Palestine. And this is an essential moment to 20 years ago after um, Oslo um, uh, Accords Agreement and the new um, neoliberal kind of economy that um, appeared in Palestine and in the Arab region. And um, the cultural scene be uh, changed from being a grassroots um, institutions like uh, popular art centers, uh, Fan Shabi, or Gallery 79, etc., to NGOs. And the, the idea of turning into NGOs is to be able to apply for European funding, to American funding, to this idea of um, the funding, which, was, which became um, the new economy in Palestine. So the fundraiser became as important as the art director, for instance. It became... Um, uh, yeah, or the director. Like you, you uh, the best thing is to have a director that, or a fundraiser that becomes an art director somehow. So, yeah, in, in 1996, I think, uh, yeah, in 1996, Khalil uh, the, the, um, Sakini was founded, and um, and it thrived during that uh, time until the Arab Spring uh, happened, and mainly in 2013 that the cultural uh, funds uh, were cut. Ford Foundation, the SDC, the Swiss uh, Fund, uh, yeah, the, we're here, <laughs> the, the Swiss Fund, um, uh, the Ford, uh, and even uh, many of the European funds were, were cut. A long story short, the cultural center um, has no money. And, um, and what happens is that you end up with um, the, mainly the artistic directors, you lay, um, they leave um, because when the funds are out, uh, the salaries um, are, are not there anymore. And what left is um, accountants and um, um, uh, administrative directors, etc., uh, assistants that cannot run a cultural institution. So in, in that kind of situation, um, um, being on the board of the center, uh, I also became the um, head of the, the chairman, right? Uh, and we began a new uh, project uh, towards um, how to challenge this issue of funding in Palestine. Um, to challenge it on many levels. One of them is the new also cultural centers. So there's uh, the, the, the medium-sized cultural centers are, are going through these um, uh, economical um, problems, but at the same time, uh, a Palestinian museum, uh, the mega institutions are opening, the Qatan Foundation are building a new building. Um, so uh, now, um, uh, in a way, we have the structures for institutions. Now it's the question about how do you produce culture with these constructions? So how did you do it in Sakakini? Because I think that's what would be a great model to share about what sort of practice and what sort of activities. Yeah. Maybe you can give us examples, nubbed, you know, all these kind of projects that you were presenting in the center with the community. Yeah, like I guess when, 
when uh, what do they say the shit hits the fan you go back to the to the community then and um, and we began inventing or re, re, reinventing ourselves in the center uh, the whole idea was how do you um, um, do crowdfunding in a place where you don't have internet banking for instance um, uh, where you know you cannot have a, a Kickstarter or a Indiegogo kind of projects um, um, campaigns simply because no one knows about uh, cultural uh, Khalil cultural center Khalil Sakini cultural center in Europe to uh, to help us, but all at the same time the one who benefit from it in Palestine cannot do um, internet. We don't have internet banking to do that. So the idea was to do uh, actually the, um, a, um, a manual kind of crowdfunding that you turn the audience from um, uh, uh, the public from audience into producers of your show. So every show um, uh, begins to bring its uh, every show, every event, every exhibition, every uh, concert begins to. Um, 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 make its funds from the public, uh, and depending on that, you can begin building and continuing your your um, your projects. So, in a way, the um, the public becomes producers of the show. They are uh, the funders, and this is creating a new kind of relation with uh, with a public that has been also infected. Uh, by uh, uh, by fundraising, so uh, in Palestine you can have um, during the last 20 years these um, projects were um, funded by Europeans, by Euro uh, by, by, well, um, by the American agency of um, uh, uh, U.S. aid, um, but they are there just to ha to happen as an event without a direct connection with the bigger uh, bigger uh, public. Um, simply because uh, the whole idea is economical rather cultural. So um, um, it, it's, it's there, these, these projects are there to create kind of an economy. Um, it's, it's funding that, um, um, that goes to salaries, that goes to uh, paying the, um, um, the venues, etc. But um, the cultural practice itself, it's alienated from its public. So what we are trying to do now more and more is to create this new kind of organic relation with the public, that the public somehow begin to produce the shows, begin um, to work on the shows. Um, um, so all our shows now in the center are in partnership with an individual, with a collective, with another institution, with another group, with another um, um, you know, collective, small collectives of, um, of artists or um, uh, cultural producers that need space or um, institutional coverage to be able to produce their, their work. Um, and this is more and more, uh, in the, for, so in the last two years, we could manage to cover around 50% of our um, um, cost and expenses, which is, we went from being um, from zero to 50% in two years, which was a big jump and, and a kind of a model that we are trying now to work with different institutions into, um, uh, uh, yeah. Doing. Yeah, I mean, I remember having worked there myself, I remember going to one of the events, which, is, which was done by this collective of students from uh, Birzeit University and um, and uh, yani, a, a group of young, uh, I want to say, cultural activists, uh, and they call themselves NUBD, which means the pulse. And they actually create a, sort of a radio program, and they, uh, they activate this radio program through like a performance style, but they also did uh, an experimentation at Sakakini uh, where they recorded this one of their radio sessions alongside an open audience. And I'd never seen this amount of young audience in my life in the space of Sakakini's main kind of cultural hall. There was barely a meter between the recording and the amount of young men and women sitting very actively wanting to hear this discourse. And for me, that was a moment, like it was an epiphany because yeah, this is not a community center, and let's not think about it this way. This is not a space that is, um, you know, just there to rent a hall. It's really kind of an actively, it's actively seeking, I think through your artistic directorship, seeking a way to bring in much more involved community 
uh, I want to say, artistic and cultural project that are meaningful for the society. And that's something that's very, uh, I, I, I want to say, the underpinning. Um, and this is how it's different from like ticketing or, you know, this is the sort of production that you're talking about. Um, I want us to segue into the other model, which is <laughs> the museum project and uh, these kind of larger institutions that are being built, which are also interestingly independent. So. The Palestinian Museum is actually fully funded by Palestinian patrons through the Welfare Association, a group of businessmen that fund the Welfare Association, pitched in the money. They also funded through Arab funds and so forth. They created the museum, which is, for a large sum of money, uh, beautifully designed by Hennigan Peng. And um, it's uh, the quotes that I've been hearing were like 27 million. In, uh, I want to say also that it's a uh, miraculous time, three years built, designed and built, and functioning as a museum to, muse to excellent museum standards. Having worked myself on the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi project, I can tell you that's a miracle. Uh, because as we know, the <laughs> Guggenheim Abu Dhabi is still in the ether in terms of as an idea. Um, and uh, and I, I think... This is something that is really quite uh, fantastic, that you have a museum that actually is self-sufficient to a large extent. It has its endowment um, to a degree. It still receives funds through other means and through other patronage and support. But, and this is in Palestine. So it's already another form of miracle. We also have the Qatan Foundation that's building in the project. I think what becomes a very crucial thing is that, great, so we have the building. And we have a museum. We, we just discussed the fact that we don't have a state. We don't have borders. Is really objects or collecting really the role of such a museum in a place like Palestine? And therefore, what is the role of a museum in a place like Palestine, really, in the absence of such cultural making institutions? I think that's a very crucial question. And, and my attempt at the answer was to really think about this museum. And, and the mandate of the vision of the institution is still happening in formation, as it should. But uh, I, I took it symbolically to the space of the museum itself, which is, um, I want to say, as I said, the hall is not big. The grounds are really open. And it's right adjacent to university. It's not a university museum, but it is right next to it. And I thought I would like this museum to really be for the people. Like, can we really think about a museum in an absence of a vision even for a state in Palestine? There's an, the, the, I want to say that even the Palestinian question, the Palestinian vision, our, our liberation struggle is in peril. It's practically disintegrated. And I thought, how can this museum, I know this seems like idealist, but how can it become a functioning beacon to think politically and culturally in a very progressive way, building a vision for a state, and therefore anchoring itself on its people? Um, I'm going to just give a, a, a little brief on the museum, the, the project that, the exhibition that I'm working on, which is the Jerusalem Lives Project. Um, and. Just to give you a little background, I, when they asked me to curate Jerusalem, a, a show on Jerusalem, I was like, I can't even go to Jerusalem. I need a permit to go to Jerusalem, which I barely ever get. And I'm mostly smuggled into the city. And I was even caught twice on the checkpoint and had a hard time with the Israelis. So it's not an easy thing for me. Uh, and I have a really, I feel like I have a contentious relationship with Jerusalem. I remember I, I recently read a review that I'd written about a show I saw in the old city of Jerusalem in 2006 that was done by Al Ma'mal Foundation. The Jerusalem show uh, is a biannual that happens there. And I remember talking about it as a place where I felt this kind of death. The city's dead. And, and that's a real, I mean, Imagine, this is the place which has most of the most important, supposedly most important historical sites for most religions. Um, you know, the Sacre Coeur gets thousands of people and it's 80 years old, but the Holy Sepulcher, you have 500 people barely there on, an, on a good day for tourism. 
Holy Sepulchre, the place where Christ is risen, the, one of the first Hellenic churches. Fascinating. I mean, where does this idea that a city with such historic places, tourism, all of it is left to die? And, and, and that's something that is really fascinating. It's, it's a gloriously beautiful city as well, so it's interesting to see. And, uh, and, and the experience of it, the living conditions are really very, very severe. And I've decided, I went on a kind of metaphorical tangent with this show and I said that in fact in Jerusalem is where globalization starts. Where universalisms, universalisms and therefore globalization started as a city and this is where it fails. And therefore, the failures of globalization in Jerusalem is where we see the failures of globalizations in global cities everywhere. And, and I'm taking this kind of ride into the city to understand all the tactics that are happening, to study it, to look at it um, in, through like multiple chapters, because that's how I work. I kind of go all over the place. So this, the hall of the exhibition is a central exhibition that is an audio-visual uh, kind of journey of research where I present my th metaphorical thesis and you look at these kind of facets of globalization in the city, politically, culturally, media, uh, ideologically, um, in the industries, the economy, and what's the results that we're finding, it, which is really what's the most fascinating is that the city is dying because it's a military lab. And security and surveillance, which are not now exported everywhere else in the world, you know, you have Netanyahu going on tweet and saying, Mr. Trump, great idea. I built a wall in Jerusalem. It works. You do it in Mexico, you know? Like, and what do you have? You have a walled off city. And you have checkpoints on every corner. And you have surveillance in the old city of Jerusalem, which is actually the model surveillance where, believe it or not, a lot of your parliamentarians from Europe go to it, go to the, see the model lab of the surveillance in the old city to see how every camera in every corner works. And therefore, they can actually take it as a model and apply it elsewhere. Fascinating. Every kind of um, metal detector, object, et cetera, is happening on the parameters of what makes the old city of Jerusalem and, uh, and, and the city of Jerusalem generally. So the green line or whatever you want to call it. So what are the tactics to resist this? I mean, you know, when, when we come to the conclusion that, for example, if I do, uh, even if I do a peaceful demonstration and someone throws a rock, you know, which is still regarded as a peaceful way of resistance, they can use the newly found, you know, canister of uh, 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 sound grenades or, so, I mean, how can, what is our ways to resist this kind of coalition? And this is happening in Jerusalem, but this is exported everywhere else. If you don't know this, Israelis are the ones training security checkpoints at the airport in Frankfurt and in various places. Israeli military is the one that is p training people in Brazil for riots and anywhere else. So what is happening that is becoming uh, fait compli and completely accept ac accepted reality everywhere in terms of, let's say, uh, a, a way of uh, really kind of closing in on diversity, um, on indigeneity, and not allowing for any authenticity for places to really prosper. I think this is a very kind of important thing. It doesn't end there, and this is where actually Yazan is introduced as an artist. That chapter, this hall, is really a lot of information. So I've decided that I don't want to end there because I don't have an answer, but I wanted to provide something that is a little bit uh, poetic as a poetic answer somehow, maybe through our collective imagination, maybe through our creative creativity, maybe through the vision of artists, there is something, maybe we can do something. And I decided that I'm gonna invite 20, 22 artists uh, in the gardens of the museum to build commissioned projects. 
Um, and, uh, and actually, this is where Yezen is going to produce one of his projects. And maybe you want to talk about that, because I don't want to go further than that. And tell us about your project. I know it's, and, and give us a little bit of the context and the history. And, I, and, and these projects are not, I'm not asking them to be direct in reference to Jerusalem, but maybe an abstraction of ideas. Thanks, Reem. Um, well, I didn't know you were doing this uh, <laughs> in the inner show. It looks amazing. Well, the thing is, I'm working on this exhibition on, on uh, two levels, right? Being an artist and also being the technical um, uh, director. Uh, meaning that I'm working with the institution and on the institution as an artist. No, like there's, and I'm taking this on somehow verbally. Um, also, being myself, I'm I'm an artist, but also I run an institution. Uh, I also work as a technical director for shows, and so I work in the proletariat of art. I would say maybe. Um, so between these different relations to culture and the cultural productions, my work is trying to um, uh, um, somehow to bring uh, to work between these different lines and these different um, uh, approaches to culture. Um, so I'm, what, I'm, what I'm doing in this project, just to give you, um, just to say it out there, it's um, I'm uh, putting a, a rock um, on the museum, um, just to imagine the museum, it's um, uh, it takes the shape of the terraces, the Palestinian traditional terraces. So it somehow um, works with the, ge the geometry of the terraces. Uh, so it's uh, it's um, it has this kind of geometry with the dents, right? <laughs> I just got to know the word. Um, and my work is a rock that is. Um, put on one of these dents, so it looks as if it's dent on the roof of the museum. Of the museum, so it's it's denting it as well. So it's between. So okay, my question begins from uh, what happens when we bring Jerusalem into the the institution, into the museum, right? How does the museum um, form? culture, but how the cultural production reforms, again, the museum. So it's, it's kind of a two-way relation between the work and the, the, the structure of the museum itself. One is forming the other, or both are forming each other somehow. Um, so in a way, when you see this, or hopefully when the work is out there, if, if I'll still have time after finishing the other artists' work, um, I will, um, it will, you, you will have this kind of um, um, a huge rock sitting on the museum and making it what it is now. Um, and for me, this is an essential question about how do we relate to Jerusalem? Is Jerusalem something that we are um, looking at from, um, is it a given or it's something that we are producing every now, yeah, every time we, we look at, at Jerusalem or we try to understand Jerusalem, we are creating, again, a way to understand it. So there is um, this kind of um, circle, a loop, that one creates the other all the time. You reminded me of Sliman Mansour's man holding, holding Jeru Jerusalem on his back. I, I guess, I guess this, this iconic painting, painting. Oh, maybe it's my in secret. Your, in uh, your subconscious. Totally, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an image of an old man who's carrying, who's hunched, he's a carrier, but is, instead of carrying the sack, he's carrying Jerusalem on his back. This was done in the early 70s and became a metaphorical image for all Palestinians in the diaspora. So you found it in posters, on Kleenex boxes, and po uh, postcards, everything. It became like the, the actual image. So it's fascinating that it's kind of in your psyche as well at the, as the same. Oh, yeah. uh, but also tell, the, tell us the reference of the Torah that you also use in your... Uh, in, in <laughs> well, yeah, and of course, when you use a rock in Palestine, you immediately go into all these symbolic meaning of the rock. The, um, the rock, the, de the dome of the, the rock that you know, all religions are um, have these narratives around the um, uh, What's the, um, in English? The temple, the the temple mount, the rock. It's it's mainly 
around this rock. That's the um, that's the metaphor around it. And then there is the um, the, the rock, uh, the dome of the rock, which is above the the same rock. Uh, so you have all of these. Um, uh, um, uh, stories and narratives about uh, a one rock that's creating all these conflicts and all these uh, structures about of religions, um, but it's also the rock, which is um, uh, the famous uh, rock in the intifadas, in the in the Palestinian resistance, the the, 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 the stone throwers. It's it's the main economical. We, we, well, the rock is called the the white um, the white oil. Um, in Jerusalem, it's the main Jerusalem export. Jerusalem is surrounded by quarries that are basically producing this rock all around Jerusalem. And it's a white, white kind of beautiful, luminescent rock that is produced. Yes. So, um, so I, I, but if I understand your project correctly, it's the, the project is on the roof of the museum that is dented. The actual museum has a roof that is like an angular shape that looks like it's a corner. And uh, Yezan decided to place the rock in the middle, uh, in the middle of that dent. And he's somehow doing something quite uh, fascinating where in the morning you see this huge rock, but at night it, it also um, glows. Glows, glows. So it looks like it's hovering or hanging. It's between, um, its heavy, heavy, between its heaviness and lightness at the same time. In the daytime, it's a very heavy rock that's forming the museum. And at night, it's floating because everything is dark. And there is only this shining or glowing rock that is um, On top floating it. in darkness somehow. So um, it's, it's between these, again, these kind of uh, possibilities of this kind of um, the rock the stone, the, the, um, the, the material itself. Um, and Jerusalem becomes um, a kind of a background for all of these things. Um, but, and, but I always try to look at these kind of the relation between the institution and its production. Because there's also this kind of, um, what do you call it, a, 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 fal a, a fallacy? Uh, like, uh, like, uh, like the question, like, if God is able to do everything, can he or she um, create a rock that he or she hims uh, th their themselves cannot carry? In a way, it becomes this kind of impossibility uh, to work with. Um, this kind of um, the institution, can it carry itself? Can Jerusalem carry its, this rock with it all the time? Um, this kind of the heaviness and the impossibility of this heaviness. That's uh, the heaviness and lightness at the same yeah. time. And um, and I just want to kind of continue. So from this type of commission, we have still 20 more qu quite large and quite, I want to say, brilliant projects that are really responding to this idea of being outdoor, being open, being entrenched in, in, uh, in the land. For me, it was very important to create these responses that are, I want to say, an antithesis to the idea of exclusion, which I think is the problem of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is being Judaized, and it's being now, I mean, we hear these things in the news, and this is no, no simple thing, no facile thing when Israel wants to become the Jewish state and wants to be recognized as the Jewish state only when it has two million people that are also non-Jewish in its constituents of, the, of its people. This is, a, this is a main kind of thing to take into consideration. Where do you go with two million who are not Jewish? And if you're the Jewish state only, what happens when you want to declare Jerusalem the capital of the Jewish state only? What happens then? This is an issue. You're excluding millions of people that also feel like they belong into this place. And this is a very kind of, um, yeah, I mean, and this is part of a lot of the policies that are happening that become an issue. Um, my third chapter after, after the commissions is the public program. And I decided I'm not, this is where this project becomes really active uh, as, as a form of um, enlivening the city. Where, where I can't reach, where the museum is not even there, I decided to create a public program where I partner with institutions from the Arab quarter of Jerusalem mainly, 
Al-Hakawati, uh, Silwan, neighborhood, the Afri African Quarter, Jerusalem grassroots, they work in various ways. They are fa facing the most dire circumstances. They can barely do their projects. And I decided, look, I'm not going to do anything myself. I'm going to go to these pe people, ask them, what do you want me to do for you? And I will do what they want. I will support them in making their projects happen in the city as a way to really create a, 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 a methodology of work. For example, Hakawati, which is a theater, uh, is can't barely run their space. They have to resort to renting it for weddings and so forth. So, and they are dreaming, for example, of re one of their projects is to uh, remake one of their old beautiful theater uh, uh, theater plays that they did in the 80s as uh, to train and, and create the, this play all over again. So maybe we support them so they can actually have a program for the next two years to, to move on. So this is like the third part. The fourth part is, and this is where I'll end, the fourth part is the catalog, but it's a, it's a symbolic act of knowledge production. I went to another very important institution in Jerusalem called the Jerusalem Quarterly. If you don't know this magazine, it's a beautiful, academic magazine, a quarterly that is produced four times a year by a great editor and great editorial team in Beirut and in uh, Palestine. Fantastic studies for the past 30 years. And I went to them and I said, I want symbolically to create a special edition of Jerusalem Quarterly. Give me uh, what, what would be this edition. And Salim Tamari, the chief editor, said, I want to do one on the, the important kind of biographies produced on Jerusalemites across you know, the past 100 years. And uh, let's produce these kind of 12, 13 essays into this special edition. And he wanted to call it Jerusalem Lives. And that's where that became the inspiration for the title of the show. And I decided the show is going to be called Jerusalem Lives. And that's it. We have time for one or two questions only, because my flight is at six and I have to run. Um, thank you both for uh, such an interesting um, conversation. And first, to work under such a dire strait and to still produce art and believe that you want to create art in a country without a state or in a situation where there is no state. And, and somehow I feel that maybe, maybe the museum would be a way to the state, as you said. We know we could start with that. And the state is about people and you, your existence marks that, I think. And uh, I think um, you know, one can take their hats off for your struggle. And I do feel for what you feel. Um, I do work with an artist who basically works with the British um, um, uh, Commission Art Council. And they do a lot of project in Ramallah. And they do a lot of projects with a bereaved woman in Ramallah. And currently they're carrying out projects. So I would be interested in possibly in, in possibly contacting you uh, through them to just possibly do some of that work. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Any other burning questions? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for thank this you. wonderful audience. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.